The 2025 Toyota Sienna minivan. For this model year, it receives some major technology advancements, including a low-key life-saving tech that has been implemented on the inside. I'm going to detail how that works, what it is, and why it's important to the industry. But first, I'm gonna cover some of the advancements or features they've added for this year. They've added a new color. They have added a refresh of the interior, including the brand new Toyota Connected infotainment, a smaller and a larger screen, depending on your trim level. They also give you a refrigerator box that has its own compressor in the second row. This is available on the Platinum and Limited trim level or optional on Limited trim level. They also give you a vacuum cleaner, which we've seen in the past, but it is very quiet and this is going to be making this van a little bit more usable. The touch points, including some of the seating surfaces, have also been updated and they've also added a woodland trim level, which is kind of that outdoorsy variant, which changes springs and dampers to raise the ride height a little bit to give it more of that SUV ground clearance. And clearly this is a minivan first, they're not trying to market it outside of that. But the big thing, and one of the reasons I'm here to talk about this, is to talk about a piece of technology that has been put on the inside part of the Sienna for the very first time in Toyota's history. It's the first vehicle to get it. And it's on the base trim level at 40 grand, all the way up to the top trim. And it's likely gonna migrate its way into other family vehicles. Now this is being marketed as a convenience feature, not a safety feature, in large part because of the legality of the wording of it. So this is called FMCW, or Frequency Modulated Continuous Wave Technology, or the, the, the short way of saying it is millimeter wave radar. And they're putting it on the inside cabin of the vehicles. Now, before you get bent out of shape, I'm gonna explain the how and the why. And this really started over eight years ago when a customer outside of Toyota emailed corporate to ask, what are you guys doing to actively mitigate the death of children and pets being locked inside a hot vehicle? So this email got circulated around and the executives were asking, hey, are we doing anything with this? And one of the engineers from Toyota Connected, Simon, who we're gonna interview here in a bit, got the idea to take this ADAS module that's on the front of all these new cars for crash mitigation, the radar systems that look for cars in front of you or people or objects that can help the computer actively break the cars or steer out of the way, why not take that technology and move it on the inside part? So he brought it to the Toyota Hackathon event, which is an internal forum where they have a panel of judges from Japan and North America to decide if these proof of concepts can go to production. And we're not talking about science fiction here, like making a minivan to 1,000 horsepower. While that would be nice, it's more practical applications that can make a big difference. The case of this millimeter wave, what it's really doing is it's a sensor. It's an all-in-one module that has processing on board with transmit and receive antennas. And what it's doing is it's sending a set frequency. In the case of the low power unit in the Sienna is a 60 gigahertz module that can go into a low power mode. In fact, it's not even active when the car's on. It only turns on when you open the door, shut it and lock the car. So this device is essentially there to give the vehicle or the software a 3D look at the car by sending frequency waves throughout the cabin in a, in a specific space. So when they did early development, they had kits that you could put on the headliner, aim it, plug a USB cable in and plug it into a computer and have the software and the image coming back to see what's in the car. And because it is technically a sensor technology, it has clear advantages over like a motion detector or a camera system. Namely in a car, it's very difficult. Can you imagine putting cameras in the back of the car in very poor light lighting conditions? You need infrared all, all over the place. It would be very hard to detect an object in a car in certain light or something like a motion sensor. Now, if a baby's sleeping, clearly they're not gonna be moving enough to set off a motion sensor to let you know that there's a kid in the car. So with millimeter wave, it can detect respiration and it can detect a heartbeat. Not just that, it can see behind things. So if a toddler crawls on the back of a car on the floorboard of the second row under a blanket, the millimeter wave sensor can pick up the fact that this there's a breathing object and a heartbeat there. 
And because of all the work over the past seven years and the work with the suppliers, they have the software figured out where not only can they tell if it's on a live object or it's just a bottle of water vibrating, they can weed out an FFT filter, those frequencies that are coming back and really weed out what's real and what's a human or what's an animal or a live object or not. And there's so much work that goes into transforming those signals or those waves back to the computer system in order to get a clear image of what's going on in the car to potentially protect the life of a child or a pet from dying from the heat. So all of this work has translated into this new technology. And how it works in short on the consumer end is you leave the car, you lock the door, it starts scanning for 90 seconds. After a certain set time, it will start to beep on the outside part of the car within the first 60 seconds. And it will beep multiple times to let you know, hey, you know, there might be something to check. You go back in the car, okay. After about 90 seconds, if there's motion or breathing or respiration detected and you've far walked away from the car, the horn will activate. The alarm system on the, the car will start to activate to let some person know on the outside part of the car, potentially a passerby, or that there's a kid or an animal in there, or to let the driver know if they're not in a building already. Now, the beautiful part about this is because they've, uh, they've connected this with Toyota Connected's new infotainment. It is connected to the internet if you have 4G connection or if you have a signal. It will actively connect from the car to send it to your phone to let you know that there was motion detected on the inside part of the car to check it out. From there, it will send an automated call if you don't respond to that. Clearly, this is all if you've opted in. But the, the special part about this is that part of the component of Toyota Connected is free for 10 years for a trial. They've literally included it for free with the car as long as you sign up for the trial and you activate the permissions. And I know, and I don't wanna get on a diatribe, but people ask, how could you leave a kid in a car? And recently I found out a friend of a friend, she has three kids and she has to drop off each kid to a different school every morning and she still has to work a full-time job. I can imagine not having any sleep, having to, to manage all of these things. And I'm not saying that you would forget the kid in the car, but I could see running to work, afraid you're not gonna be able to pay your bills. You know, you're on your last strike at work for being late. I could see how it's possible. And this is a technology that's there to potentially just that one day where you slip up maybe help you out of a, a serious crisis. So I'm gonna go and talk to some of the engineers about how this all came about. So these gentlemen have had the opportunity to work on developing the latest technology that is getting implemented in Toyota products. The case of the Sienna, it's got pretty, pretty much two major updates. That is the Toyota Connected infotainment system uh, it's one of the, actually the last Toyota product to get this, and now you're integrating a new radar-based occupant safety system for the rear two seats, or second row and the third row. So we're going to talk a little bit about how that came about and the development process of making that work. So earlier, you guys shared that there was an email from a customer explaining a very tragic story, and this is common where people leave pets or humans in the car, in a hot car, it could be a death sentence. So there's this need to develop new technology to protect us from ourselves in many cases. You could say the same thing about airbags and all the other miscellaneous safety systems. So walk me through when you guys got started on this project and your mindset of like, just sticking a radar sensor to the headliner of the car to see if it worked. My first introduction to the, the problem statement was a few months before the hackathon. We had a town hall, and our, one of our leaders uh, got up and, and shared, a, uh, shared a story of the hot car, but he also shared this uh, seemingly unrelated story at the time of uh, earthquake victims, I think it was in Turkey. And NASA and JPL had got together and developed this metal detector-like looking system that could look for victims buried in the rubble using a millimeter wave radar. And um, the two things got connected and I was like, this is a really interesting problem. And uh, you know, I had two young children myself at the time, like, oh, this is, this is kind of scary and uh, we, should, we should look to see if we can do something with this at the, at the hackathon. And where did you get involved in the process? I sort of got involved towards the end of the prototype and concept phase. So basically we had this idea, we had maybe an inclination to use this technology of millimeter wave radar, and then I sort of kind of came in and helped with a lot of the productionalization of this technology, taking it from 
you know, a prototype system. In some cases, it was, you know, taped to a headliner of our a vehicle with USB cables running down like the V pillar to basically an integrated system that's packaged in the vehicle, working with other stakeholders to integrate it. You know, previously it was basically a sensor that we were getting output onto a, usually like I think an Intel Nook or something like that with a display, taking that and integrating it into the existing rear seat reminder logic that we have currently on the vehicle, basically as an improvement to that, adding that sort of active sensing component. So it was a lot of just taking, you know, concept layout and then working with related stakeholders, whether they're here in North America and Japan to bring it to market. And in terms of it, the, the way that the system works is the final production version gets this module placed above the headliner so you don't see it, the customer doesn't see it. And you, it's sending out a signal, a, a, a chirp, at a specific rate and it's doing a scan and pinpointing different potentials in there and then receiving back that data. So it's looking for, if it's the same signal sent and received, there's nothing there. So you're looking for a variation in that signal, which sounds very simple on paper. And when you look at the graphs and everything, oh, okay, that makes sense. But tell us, talk about the, the finer detail of making that work. Yeah, it's, it's very complicated. And like I said, thankfully we had, you know, significant partnership with our suppliers as well as, you know, global collaboration with our counterparts in Japan. But basically, you know, instead of looking for fixed objects in the road or other vehicles, which we have on current uh, frequency modulated continuous waves on the exterior applications, you're looking at things that are changing with respect to distance. So part of that is using the chirp cycle to basically see, you know, what is the round trip time of this, and then based on that, calculate the distance kind of into these different range bins that we use for uh, radar applications. And then also the reflectivity of the object, so the round trip power, basically, you emitted a TX wave at this you know, power level, basically, and what is the received level, and from that you can determine the reflectivity of the object. So basically taking not only the kind of localization of where the points are and how many, and also the reflectivity, is kind of what goes into a lot of the object, kind of, or sorry, occupant detection on this system. So uh, it was very complex and there was a lot of tuning that was required. Thankfully we had, like I said, significant report from our suppliers as well as our counterparts in Japan um, to bring the system to market. So. so the evolution of this, clearly there's no way that a couple people could look at all this data. So how, with the massive amounts of data points that you were accumulating over this, essentially what, six or seven year development cycle of it, um, how did you get all these teams together and what software were you using? Were you using machine learning? It, it Explain some of that. For, for the prototypes, like, like Mike said in the beginning, you know, we, we got some pretty powerful laptops together and then Intel Nooks and uh, we actually developed some uh, data collection algorithms that we would just uh, essentially hit, hit the record and get a raw recording of all of those um, radar returns, uh, run them through set of filtering algorithms provided by the, the suppliers. And then we did work with our machine learning scientists and data scientists to uh, try and isolate out the various occupants in the vehicle. Uh, but yeah, we've collected um, terabytes of, 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 of raw data recordings. It's, be, it's being marketed more as a convenience feature versus a pure like safety function. Um, at what point in this development were you guys like 100% sure, like, okay, we're ready to roll this out? What was that, that point where you're like, okay, let's get it into production? How did you know that it was ready? Towards the end of 2021, early 2022 was when we're like, this, this is a technology that is, um, is ready for the automotive industry. It's, it's the right technology that Toyota wants to adopt. Um, there's enough... Uh, that there's, there's suppliers available to work with for the auto industry. I think for me, it was probably the first prototype vehicle build uh, for this uh, 25 model year Sienna project. Because like before that, it was like looking at CAD basically for the packaging of the sensor, looking at the control model basically in our model-based development framework. So it was kind of playing around with these individual components. And we were of course also you know, retrofit evaluation with the sensor. I think the first prototype vehicle build and seeing the full vehicle, basically everything integrated. Clearly there's the hardware part of it, which you can stick the sensor in any car, but that's not going to work without the software layer and all the, the finer right. granular detail of how you make it work and the data work. The other layer to this is bringing the Toyota Connected division in, not just the infotainment, people see infotainment and think Toyota Connected, but it's the telematics part, the cloud-based transfer of that data. No, I came in, I've been in technology for 18 plus years now, we're talking large-scale web apps and all kinds of stuff on server-side technologies. But this is my first project like on, on a vehicle project, and especially for a company like Toyota, uh, and, and really recognizing how much work actually goes into making 
uh, physical hardware product um, that Toyota puts its name on, that stamps its name onto that product. Uh, it was very eye-opening to me. Like, have, I think I said earlier, it takes a village to, uh, to, to build this, and it's maybe a small army right, and from around the world. And that was very eye-opening and uh, actually really good to see like, the due care and attention that everybody puts into even, even the, the routing of the wire harness, right? Yeah. Like the, uh, what type of glue to use to, to mount this thing to the, to, to the headliner. It was interesting. You know, this is not a product that's technology for technology's sake either. I think that's maybe what's interesting about it too. And it's no, again, it's going to be forgotten. It's hidden. It doesn't have some big marketing name. It's kind of like a really cool tech that's going to help people, but it's not glamorous, right? It's, you can't market it as like, oh, look, there's a 50-inch screen in here, you know. Yeah. Um, but it's going to have a big impact on families. And I think that's that's interesting part of having you guys here and working on this because I think it's going to evolve and there's so many different ways and I know you can just spitball. I'm sure you guys have been talking about this internally, like all the different things you could do with this. Yeah. One of the, the first presentations we did actually at R&D headquarters uh, was to, to the vehicle chiefs. And the, the head of that group at the time, uh, she, she turned around and said, I don't want 29, 29 sensors to do 29 different things. Um, what else can we do with it? It doesn't need to be today, but what else can we do with this in the future? And uh, that, that, that phrase stuck with me uh, a lot. And it, it got, we got the team talking and, and we filed over 40 patents for the use of the technology, not necessarily this use case, right? Um, okay. And not necessarily for the next couple of years even, but uh, the, the sky's the limit of what we could do with it. Uh, down the road, we need to prioritize, and this is obviously the, the priority use case. Now, I hope you have a better picture of how the system works and why it was developed. Now, initially, if you don't opt to have any of the connected features through the phone or having text messages done, this hardware will always work in the car. It will always physically beep the car or honk the horn if you leave somebody in there. So it it's, doesn't even need to be connected to the internet to completely function. And I think that's a really smart choice. I also like the fact that they have not included cameras, that they've done the, the, the basics here to kind of make this system function without worrying about the privacy part. Now, clearly you can expand this out. In an electric car, you can just turn on, have the car turn on the air conditioning if there's a hot kid in there that's been detected, right? There's future adaptations that you could do with this that can be scaled out. But as a proof of concept gone into production, it's really neat how they've, how they've done it. And it's not, again, it's not technology for technology's sake. It's actually there to help people. So I wanna say thank you to the engineers who worked on this. Oftentimes in a corporate job, you know, you really don't get to share what you're doing. So I really appreciate the fact that they took the time to do this. Guys like Corey and Jacob on the PR team from Toyota Connected, you know, they really value this type of video that we're doing and this work that we're doing to try to dig in deeper and teach people how things work. And of course, from the PR side, Jen and Paul and everybody else that's worked with us, Kurt as well. There's times like this where everybody is really has their heart into it. And I really appreciate it, guys. Thanks for watching. I'll see you next video.